All right, uh, this is the section on deep learning for the big data application analytics course. I'm uh, Jeffrey Fox, your um, instructor. And that's not a very good color. We'll try a better one here. Let's try blue. So, here's blue. Um, so, now this, uh, this is a lesson that's about uh, 20 slides long. And it will describe uh, some of the components which are needed, or component, component technology ideas needed in deep learning, some of which we actually saw in our first deep learning example of the multilayer perceptron. All right. So here are these uh, basic terms. That's the topic of this lesson. And we'll look at activation, where we'll look at RELU, sigmoid tenth, and softmax. The loss function, we've already mentioned that. The optimizer, we've mentioned issues there. We've already actually mentioned stochastic gradient descent. We didn't mention back propagation. We uh, talked about one half vectors in the example. And we also mentioned uh, the problems with banishing gradient, but not in any depth. All right, so that's what we'll go through. Uh, one to three slides on each topic. Here is the list of the topics, and it actually has um, Wikipedia and Deep AI, and yeah, that's where all these particular comments come from. Uh, both of Wikipedia and Deep AI are good sources for this type of material. All right, so here's a sort of a cosmic introduction to a neural net picture. So here is a physical neuron. Uh, with axons and dendrites, these are the connections. And then this is uh, abstracted uh, here into uh, a cell, inputs and outputs. So that's given in more detail here. Uh, we have all these inputs, and which are effectively co correspond to axons. And um, those have weights and inputs. X is as the input coming from the previous layer, W is the weight. And the typical thing you would do at the cell is do the weighted sum of the inputs, adding a bias and then doing something with that. Uh, such as, a, and that's what activations do. They do different activation layers, do different things with that number. Um, as we want to calculate the first first order derivative with respect to all the unknowns of these functions, it is actually a little non-trivial if there's some issues with differentiability. Either the the uh, the uh, difference is uh, very small, if the differential is very small, or it's discontinuous or zero or things like that. By the way, the simplest. Uh, Activation function, which we don't have a page for because we don't typically, we don't often use it as a linear activation, which just means you multiply the number by a constant. Or actually, the best version thereof is just the linear, just f of x equals x. Namely, it just in this example here accumulates the uh, weighted sum of the inputs. So here is deep AI's. Um, Definition of an activation function. Uh, they're very important because they really um, are the distinctive feature of neural nets because previous um, approaches never had activation functions. They often have matrices, which is what uh, these uh, networks end up becoming giant matrix matrix multiplications, but they never had activation functions. Activation functions are responsible for the special features of these networks, and probably responsible for their amazing performance. Um, and they produce nonlinearity. Now you could have imagined, you know, sitting in your desert island, that was a bad idea, but all the experience is it's a wonderful, great idea. And it's this nonlinearity that is producing this much better performance of neural nets than previous approaches. Here is the first, maybe one of the more popular these days, um, uh, 
Activation unit called a rectified linear unit, RE for rectified, LU for linear unit, and it's this function here. Zero up to argument zero, and then it's just y equals x thereafter. Very simple. So it's the max of naught and x. So you can see his x continuing down here. We're replacing all these negative values by zero. All right, that's the simplest. And here is deep AI's description of why RELU is useful. Um, and it's uh, become especially popular because it has, it is actually trivial to compute compared to some of the other ones. And also, it doesn't have as many vanishing gradient problems because at least if the argument's positive, the gradient's a healthy one. It's one. Best, I mean, effectively the most useful gradient. Whereas some of the older activation layers, they had difficulties, especially when the argument x was uh, very negative or very positive. So here is a typical of the other type of activation function, which is a smooth curve. And it uh, does, it actually go it levels off on both sides, and uh, it's just one over one plus e to the minus x, a very simple form. You can see as x goes to infinity, uh, the function goes to zero, so x goes to minus infinity. S goes to plus infinity, e to the minus x becomes zero. The function goes to one, and this levels off pretty quickly because exponentials grow so rapidly that. Uh, it doesn't require much of an x for this e to the minus x to dominate. Tenth is actually a very similar shape, except it goes from minus one to one. And in fact, you can show this, uh, this uh, elementary uh, uh, inequality that you can show. And um, e to the, that is actually just a set of exponentials. It's a factor. You can express it in terms of the sigmoid. If sigma is the sigmoid function, tenth of x is twice the sigmoid of 2x minus 1. You can just plug in the previous formula to show that. Softmax, wow. So here we have a, we, we um, here we have, we're trying to, uh, Classify things, and here we have apple, bear, candy, dog, and egg as the outputs. And then in the softmax, it actually converts all these um, things into probabilities. So it actually forms this thing here. Either the, if we have an input coming to this softmax of x, it's either the minus x over the sum of all of them here. So, and that means that, we're, that um, the sum of the outputs is always one, uh, which is good if you're classifying, because you want it to be something. So this will tell you the probability that it's uh, a, 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 these particular candidates, 75% an apple, 25% a polar be a bear. All right, so that's softmax. All right, I've already told you what the loss function is. It's um, the um, thing you're minimizing, the objective function in other terminology, the energy function. Are, um, and it's described here and in many places. Because all we are doing is solving an optimization problem. And I, I went through some general optimization issues. And um, we have uh, the deep neural network defines that the, the, um, has a state, and um, we are trying to minimize the loss function. And um, stochastic gradient descent, which we'll go into in later very soon, is the way we minimize this loss function. And we use so-called regularization, which I which has again been around for a long time. I wrote my first paper on regularization 50 years ago. Um, that was for somewhat more modest problems. And put local minima and overfitting, which is um, uh, just saying you have too many parameters, so you can always uh, get the right answer. 
and that's very dangerous because it means that you are very sensitive to details of the input data. Uh, typically, you don't get so much overfitting again. I think it's this nonlinearity uh, with the activation functions that stops overfitting being as serious a problem as it would be in other methods. We use maximum likelihood almost in, uh, invariably because it's the basic uh, probability formalism that you want when you're comparing, trying to, when you have models and you have data and you want to compare the model with the data, you write down the likelihood of observing the data given the model. And it is, uh, this is a, and you're trying to maximize it. And so you take, you take minus the log and then you minimize it. So the log is for convenience and the minus is to convert maximum to minimum. Um, here's another citation. Here is a simple a loss function, which is uh, true for dis uh, more discrete data. Uh, you have a loss function, you have an input value, and it's a loss function is zero if the output equals the in input, and it's one if the input is not equal to the output. So it penalizes um, incorrect answers. Uh, typically, when I'm more used to things like this, the so-called chi-squared or least squares value, you have an input and, and uh, um, an output, and you just take the difference and square it, and uh, typically you normalize it by one over the total number of such quantities, and that's your quadratic loss function, a very common one. It's not always capable, it corresponds actually to the data being uh, having a Gaussian distribution, which is not always true. Um, so formally, this is called the cross entropy, and that's the difference between the predictions and the training data. And um, sometimes you use this um, chi-squared value, and um, which is the minus the log of the I mean, Gaussian is e to the minus this. And so if you take minus the log, you'll get this. So this, no, this thing here is very easy to get for Gaussian distributions. Um, convolutional and recurrent nets lead to more complex formulae. And backpropagation is the technique that you use to do these in general. And it's designed to do these layered networks. I noticed that most LOX functions are just sum over a loss function for a particular measurement. Because um, they're multiplied in the likelihood, when you take the log of the likelihood, they become a sum. So the if you have lots and lots of measurements, D measurements here, then your total loss is the one over D times the sum over all the losses of the D um, observations. So now we come to stochastic gradient descent, which I view as a major discovery. Coming entirely from the deep learning community, I didn't see it except in there. And I would view it as an exciting new approach to optimization, which probably can be used, it probably in effect is used outside steep learning. But it was invented for deep learning. Steepest descent or gradient descent is very, very old. I certainly used that over 50 years ago. Uh, so it says that if we have a bunch of parameters and a function, uh, then this direction here, d, d L, d alpha p, it is the direction of maximum change in the function L for a given size shift. So if you're shifting uh, distance eta, and you want to, given that you have an eta shift, and you can choose which direction in this space to shift it, if you shift in this direction here, with a minus d l d alpha p, you will get for this value of eta the biggest shift downwards. So that's why it's called steepest descent. It's a greedy algorithm. You get the most bang for the eta. Now the most important change here is stochastic and stochastic gradient descent. And it's sort of very subtle. You can think of it in two ways. The deepest way to think about it, sorry, the simplest way to think about it is, well, we're summing over all the uh, all the losses for the individual individual observations. We'll just do that as a partial sum, and so we'll take uh, we'll take a batch. Supposing we have um, 
a batch size of 128, and a total of 1024 measurements. We'll take eight batches, we'll do 128 in each batch, and we'll calculate a, 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 a subsidiary shift for each after each batch. Because after batch number one, we use the results from the batch to feed into batch number two, this is not equivalent to doing them all at the same time. One can, and by the and by the way, you eventually run all of the, you, you eventually do the same as you would in the simple case of summing over everything. You would eventually sum over everything because you, the, when you go through all the batches, then you get a so-called epoch, and I mentioned you might get 10 to 100 epochs in total needed. And you you run so many times over all parameters, and it is desired to do this stochastically. Namely, if you have 128, you choose that 128 randomly from the total distribution, which I said was 1024 in my simple example. Um, now, a deeper way to look at it is to use the so-called central limit theorem, which says, well, if I have this thing here, the sum. Actually, 1 over b, uh, k, sum from k equals 1 to b, is an estimate of the total. That's the central limit theorem. That the, uh, when you take, if you have a set of observations, you average the observations as you're doing here, that is asymptotically gives you an estimate of the mean. And the mean loss is what you have here. So this thing here is rigorously approximated by that as long as B is big enough, and um, it's uh, and it only differs therefore by second order errors from the right answer. So it's got a lot of positive. It's technically correct, in the, and I mentioned by actually choosing a pretty small eta, doing lots of these small shifts, you can actually get a better convergence, which because of the jiggling of all the stochasticity jumps over little bad local minima and actually avoids some of the problems that the simple full sum would have. Okay, so I've already told you about epochs um, and that we need 10 to 100 probably to converge. The batch size, well actually in our first one the batch size was four, but typically it's a bigger, 128 to 1034 and actually due to the need of parallel computing, which is most easily done by increasing, by taking parallelism of an individual um, data data values inside a given batch, you usually make um, implies the batch has to be bigger, so we can parallelize over the entries in each batch. So the batch sizes have been big for giant jobs, um, and that means they actually need more epochs to converge. I've already told you about the, the typical form here. Uh, there's the learning rate eta, and you just, that's a so-called hyperparameter which you play with. And um, so it was point, point 0.01 in the famous AlexNet, and then it was actually reduced once the accuracy uh, uh, leveled off. Momentum is another important idea to actually to um, calm down the changes. So um, instead of actually taking this direct delta alpha p with this eta in the steepest descent direction, you actually tr tend to make it mostly the previous value, and then you just add on a little bit of the new value. In fact, m is 0.9, showing that 90% of the shift of this iteration came from the previous shift. So that's pretty important. Uh, change. And so this all trying to make it converge better and not get stuck and not go wild. Um, there's also weight decay, which is trying to um, actually get to, to disturb it. I told you that uh, sometimes uh, you have to, to get out of local minima, you really need to just change where you are. So that's partly done by this weight decay which uh, says that the alpha will change by a, a, a fraction um, WD of alpha P. Um, and then 
There are other, then after that, there are a whole set of clever optimization strategies which actually take the shift and vary it on a more um, parameter dependent fashion. And there are three methods which are sort of related, they give you similar ideas. Adam is actually the most popular. The one I define here is a <coughs> Adagrad adaptive gradient algorithm, which basically put, puts in the, to the eta a p-dependent normalization. So that um, if the thing has been changing a lot, you actually reduce the shift. Because you know you divide it by some mean squared change over the last few time sets, or the, or the previous time steps, the average change. So these are all, these are all, so that these, is, these are good examples of heuristics. They're not theory, but they've been learned by experience that they actually make things better. All right, back propagation. Well, this is a very old idea, and it's actually just mathematics, and in fact, it's just what's called the chain rule. Here is the chain rule. If you have a, one, if you have a function f, of a, which is a function of another function g, and um, you want to actually calculate it, you, you do the derivative with respect to its argument of f, that's, that's that argument is g, that's dg of f, and then you differentiate g with respect to x and multiply them together. And x here is all the things you're varying, the weights, the biases, and so on. And as we'll make clear on the next, uh, next slide, uh, which actually repeats this diagram, if you have a layered network, the, this uh, last layer, this output, a, a, the output thing f, is working on these things here. Well, those things here are just g, are the thing called g, which is the function which is represented here. And the function represented here is related to the function here. So you have a hierarchical <coughs> chain rule, f of g of h of i of j of k, and that's, they move back through the network. That's called back propagation. Because you start here and move backwards. Whereas when you're calculating, you start here and move this way. So derivatives are done backwards, calculations forward. And here it's sort of written out. Um, here's actually F4, F3, F2, F1. And these are just the results of the activation functions at those layers. And you just go, you just apply the chain rule. Now. This is why you're using Keras and TensorFlow. They've already <coughs> done all of this for you. So you never have to think about this. It's all automatic. Actually, Keras might even be doing itself automatically because people have built so-called uh, computer differentiation. So you can take these types of, of complex functions, because it is pretty complex to get it right. Because there's so many layers, they're quite complicated, connected, and to get all the uh, arithmetic right is non-trivial. So you can't. Sometimes people use automatic differentiation, but it's possible suddenly to do it by hand. So that's backpropagation. It's very old, important idea, and not deep. It's just mathematics. If you once you have this this um, that, this uh, structure, the deep thing was to have this structure with all these connections and these activation layers. That was the deep idea. But once you've done that, you have to use the chain rule. There is no choice. I've already told you what a one-heart vector is. We, entry, entry, we actually used it in the, um, our first deep learning example. We, that one-heart that one vector had 10 values for 0, 1 through to 9. Here I just did four values and told you. Here's the, if I have four categories, these are the four representations I have. This is just the core, the one hot representation. And the structure of those networks is such that one hot representations are much easier to deal with for many purposes. Um, they have the disadvantage, they're rather inefficient. Um, 
What about balancing gradient? Well, I take this from this particular Deep AI link. Sometimes Deep AI gives good description, sometimes not so good. Here it's looking uh, pretty good. Um, so I told you how to calculate the gradient. And it's, you start at the end and move, move, move forward through the network. Well, if you're not, if you have vanish, if the derivative is zero, you'll never change a, a variable. Because remember, the loss the variable is the direct is the amount of shift. Eta the loss the variable. So if the loss the variable is zero, you won't shift that variable. It will get stuck. So vanishing gradients are serious. And I told you there are some circumstances, especially as we're doing lots of multiplications, where zeros can propagate and cause lots of trouble. And especially true, it's not going to be true on our small, simple uh, uh, problems, but on larger problems, vanishing gradients are much more serious. And um, you basically uh, you find that you cannot determine variables later in the network, and so. You have to do things like training layers at a time, so you focus on a particular layer near the end. Um, there is also ability of, of adding links. You see, normally in these things, you go from layer 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 n to layer n plus one, but you can go from layer n to layer n plus two or n plus four and so on. And these jumping things tend to stop the vanishing gradients. We also pointed out when we defined RELUs that they actually have they have uh, fewer problems than some of the other um, uh, activation functions because they don't have the saturation zero. The the tant and the sigmoid has a, has a has a um, um, problem because they level off at large values and small values, and both as the Value levels off the derivative gets nearer and nearer zero, and it does that exponentially, actually. So it's pretty, it's a pretty serious problem. All right, so that's the end of these little uh, descriptions of little um, concepts, and so thank you very much. Okay, folks, last slide in this set, and we're going to look at uh, hyperparameters with from. And we've done a minor adaption of the deep AI definition. And this basically a hyperparameter because it's a parameter determining parameters. So a good example is the batch size, which we mentioned when we were discussing stochastic gradient descent. In the actual design of the neural net, there's the number of hidden layers and their nature and their size. There's that learning rate eta. The number of epochs, although that might be determined well, <coughs> that you can actually save the results and just keep running till you get a small enough uh, accuracy. Momentum, that's a important parameter, which again you could and uh, you need to determine the method of regularization or the if it's a, adding a constant time something that's constant is also a hyperparameter, and. It, it's also worth noticing the genetic algorithms are well suited for many of these optimization problems because they're discrete optimization of sort of cosmic things. And that's, of course, what genetic algorithms do. They're cosmically modifying the human race, whereas neural nets are tactically ensuring that we're not run over by high speed hippopotami, which are traveling around and on our roads. So. That's hyperparameters. Thank you, folks.